So as if you've been tracking with us, you know that we are doing a series called Follow Me. And what we are trying to do is learn the ways of Jesus so that we can do what Jesus did and so become like him. And we've been looking through this year at the teachings of Jesus, but some of his teachings are tough. And uh, not all of them are rah, rah, rah. Some of them are weighty and some of them are really, really difficult. And this is one of the really, really difficult teachings of Jesus that requires us to really pay attention to what he is saying. Because I really think that if we as the church get this right as our habits and way of doing things, we can then get so many other things right that Jesus shares. So just, so as we we get to this, and you can just, you don't have to put up your hands, but how many of us in this room have been hurt by someone? I think if the stats are true, every single one of us at some point in our life have been wounded or hurt by someone. Maybe a stranger, maybe a loved one, maybe a parent, a spouse, um, somebody in your church community. Uh, It might have been a few years ago. It might have been this week. But we have had to process being sinned against, being hurt or wounded by someone. How many of us have hurt another person at some point in our lives? And again, it might have even been something that happened this week where we sinned against another person. It might have been your child, your spouse, a family member, your neighbor, a colleague. Again, it's so wide in the scope of interpersonal relationships and how people have this ability to wound and sin against, but how we have the ability to sin and wound other people. And so Jesus is very clear, and in fact, it's the hallmark teaching of Jesus, is our ability to live in and forgive people who have wronged us. And this is the teaching that we are going to look at um, of Jesus today. So turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. It's a long chapter, and we're going to look at a lot of Matthew 18, because context Uh, And clarity is so important when we talk about forgiveness because it's also something that the church has maybe not gotten right and there's a lot of abuse that happens around this word forgiveness and the expectations created about forgiving people. So we're going to be looking at Matthew 18. Now, before we just dive right into Matthew 18, just on the timeline of the Gospels, Matthew 18 is coming at the end of Jesus, what we call his public or earthly ministry. We know Jesus ultimately goes to the cross where he dies, on the cross in our place for our sin. But for about three and a half years before that, he is living with a group of men that he called to follow him and crowds and people started to live and journey with Jesus as he taught them the nature of the kingdom. He showed them what it means to be a follower of him. He invited them in and he said, come and follow me. But now this is at the end. In fact, in the timeline, this is about a week before Jesus enters Jerusalem before the crucifixion. And so Matthew 18 is kind of like the final instructions that Jesus wants his disciples to know. And almost the entire chapter of Matthew 18 is about interpersonal relationships. How you deal with people who sin against you or wrong you. Because if you are a follower of Jesus, it is going to happen. But because we follow Jesus, there is a way that we operate as people who live out the kingdom. And as we're going to see in this chapter, it is very different to the way that the world does forgiveness and conflict. And so Matthew 18, this hallmark teaching of Jesus, and we're going to do it a little bit inverted. We're going to do the back end of Matthew 18, and then we're going to do the front end of Matthew 18. And so you might know this parable really well, but I think we're all going to learn something new about this teaching of Jesus. So 
Matthew 18, verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owned him 10,000 bags of gold, or your translation might say talents, was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay you back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him but a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. Pay it back to you. But he refused. Instead, he went off and he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had mercy on you? In his anger, the master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Really intense parable, and there is a lot going on here. But the first and foremost thing that we get from that parable is it seems that the Father takes our ability or inability to forgive really seriously. And if you've uh, been tracking with us as we've been teaching through the Gospels this year, when the disciples went to Jesus and said to Jesus, teach us how to pray, and Jesus taught them something to pray every single day, and you remember the prayer, and this is a big deal. If Jesus says you should pray this every single day, there is a line in that prayer that he taught us that goes something along the lines of, Jesus, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. That this way of living out the kingdom, this counterculture, upside down nature that is so different to the world, embedded in our daily rhythms that Jesus taught is come to me for forgiveness as you give forgiveness to people every single day. The way of the kingdom and this hallmark teaching of Jesus is that we live in forgiveness. But forgiveness is easy, right? Yeah? I mean, it's just something that we can just like, so easy. Hey, if we think about the, the nature of some of the sin that has been done to us. And again, just a survey of this room by just a stats point of view, some of the stuff is going to be horrific. And so what Jesus is asking us to do is like, Jesus, but you don't understand when my father walked out on us when we were just babies and the financial hardship that we endured, that we still have the lingering thing. I'm supposed to just forgive that? And the drunk driver that took out my family, I'm supposed to forgive that? And the person that caused that pain, I'm supposed to forgive that? But as we're going to see, the answer is, is yes. And we're gonna see how Jesus gets there and the steps that he takes to help us release forgiveness with people. But to first get to what we mean by, I, I forgive you. <laughs> to, to 
answer the question, what is forgiveness? We need to also go have a look at what forgiveness isn't and what Jesus isn't meaning because when Peter comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, how many times am I supposed to forgive people? Is it seven times? And, and I've, I've heard a lot of people try to unpack this. You know, like, is Peter trying to like, hey, Jesus, I'm getting this. And I think there is a measure. Remember, Jesus has been with these guys for about three and a half years. He's been teaching and modeling the kingdom. And he's been teaching about relationships and interpersonal relationships. So Peter is, is starting to get it. And so he's going like, Peter, or Jesus, when somebody wrongs me, how many times do I forgive them? Is it seven times? He's trying to understand what forgiveness looks like in the kingdom and, and what it means to forgive someone as a follower of Jesus. And then Jesus brings this insane number. No, not seven, 77 times. Now, is that just a random number that Jesus is giving out? Now, nothing is random with Jesus. And so I wonder how many of you are aware that the number seven and 77 together in a story appears one other time in the Bible. And it happens to be in Genesis chapter four. And so a snapshot of Genesis chapter four is there are two brothers, Cain and Abel, and Cain murders his brother. He is sent away. And as he goes out, he builds himself a city and five generations later, there is the city of the descendants of Cain. And one of Cain's descendants is a person by the name of Lamech. And there is a poem in Genesis chapter 4 that Lamech uh, says. And, and this is very, very interesting. And this is Genesis chapter 4, 23 to 24. Lamech said to his wives, Adar and Zilia. Listen to me, wives of Lamech, hear my words. He is boasting. He's called his family together. I killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech, 77 times. Now, is it a coincidence that Jesus who is bringing the kingdom of God on earth and showing people what it means to be a follower of Jesus, uses and refers to the numbers of this poem of Lamech. No, because understand the trajectory of the fall and the descendants of Cain and where sin enters humanity and what we are seeing in, maybe we can call it Lamech's murder poem, is the full extent of our human nature. Revenge. Here is someone who wounded me and I murdered him so badly, the vengeance was paid 77 times. Boasting about how he got that person back for injuring him. Not, did he repay it eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth? No, 77 times. I extracted my vengeance on this young man who wounded me. And so this becomes the, the full example of our sinful nature left unchecked. And I love the Bible Project and a great podcast to listen to. And, and Tim Mackey, the author of the Bible Project, goes, you know, when you look at this, Lamech becomes the standard of revenge in the human nature. And I'm going to come back to this because maybe not outwardly, because we've got laws and, and we do see that with some of the murders that happen in our country, but this is the state of our heart. Because while we might not outwardly extract vengeance on somebody 77 times what they did to us, but what happens in our hearts that nobody sees when we're lying in bed stewing over what was done to us and what we fantasize about getting back at that person is very Lamech-like in our hearts. And that we dream, oh wow, if that person could just burst a tire on the highway and veer out of control and fall off a cliff and roast alive in flames. Yes, sometimes our hearts go there, 
right? We've thought thoughts about people and we've wished things about people. And so there is this thing in our hearts that Jesus is calling us to deal with because at the end of that parable, where is forgiveness happening? It's in our hearts, Jesus says, unless you can forgive your brother and sister in your heart. And so what he's calling us to do, because Lamech is this excessive, unbridled revenge, but as followers of Jesus, what Jesus is calling us to is a polar opposite of that excessive revenge. It's lavish forgiveness, forgiveness that doesn't make sense, forgiveness that shouldn't seem possible for another human being, but in the kingdom of God, there is something different about the way that we live and what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So I did say we were gonna deal with what forgiveness isn't. So jump a few verses ahead or or, or further up or back in Matthew uh, 18. I want you to find verse 15. And here Jesus is teaching us on how to deal with people when they sin against us. And this is such a clear um, process for dealing with things within the body of Christ. And so Jesus says this, when your brother or sister sins, go and point out their faults. Wives, don't highlight that. Just between the two of you, if they listen, I might actually have to ask for forgiveness for that one. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, Take one or two others along so that matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So in this um, the whole chapter of Matthew 18 where Jesus is teaching about a lavish uh, way of forgiving that is counter to the human nature, that shows what it's like to be a follower of Jesus. Before he gets to that parable, he gives some very practical steps on dealing with sin. So what we need to be clear on, because sometimes churches get this idea of 77 times you need to forgive someone, is that you just need to go home and put up with whatever nonsense you have to deal with in your life. And uh, no, that person is super toxic that you live with. No, forgive them, just forgive them. Forgive them 77 times. So what does Jesus mean about forgiveness? Well, let's go through and uh, do a quick breakdown of Matthew 18, verses 15, 16, and 17. So it's very simple. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and talk to them about it. Now, again, this is not easy, but it's the process. And so within the kingdom, conflict is hard, but we do it differently. Because what forgiveness is not is sweeping it under the rug. Forgiveness is not pretending something didn't happen to you. Forgiveness is not hoping that if I keep quiet about it, it might go away. What is the first thing that Jesus tells us to do in dealing with when somebody sins against us? Go and confront and deal with it and go and talk to the person who has sinned against you. There's no keeping quiet. There's no pretending it didn't exist. There's no sweeping it under the carpet. It is going to the person and saying, you have sinned against me. Now, again, it might not be possible because the person has died or uh, you you don't have access to that person. And obviously, we're dealing with best case scenario where you do have access to the person. And so then it's like, but now this person doesn't want to listen to me. This person has rejected me speaking to them about how they sinned against me. What do I do now? Well, Jesus is really clear about that. Well, if the person has rejected you and has not heard your heart and has responded well and, and uh, gone, you're right. Let me own up to what I've done. I did sin against you. Will you please forgive me? I am sorry. Because really as believers, that should be how it works. But if we fail at that point, 
and I love this about the teaching of Jesus, don't be alone with that person again. Right, if they have sinned against you and are not prepared to apologize and deal with and own how they sinned against you, Jesus says, take two or three people with you. Don't go be alone again with that person. Right, go with other people so you are safe. And I love what he says because then we can establish what's going on with witnesses. Because I am not perfect. And so sometimes I have actually been the one who was at fault. And with wisdom of other people going, Craig, actually, hang on. Is this what happened? Your facts, your facts? Oh, hang on, Craig, actually. And witnesses can establish something. And especially if they are wise people that you can bring in and go, this is what happened. Man, I, I just love the wisdom of Jesus here. Because if someone sinned against me, I went to them, I said, you sinned against me. This is what happened. This is what God's word says. This is what you did. You need to know that what you did was wrong and it hurt me. And the person goes, oh, you know, go get lost, Craig. And so I bring two people along with me to go, look, read here in God's word. This is what you did. Hear the facts, people. And the witnesses go, look, you did sin against Craig. You need to repent and apologize for what you have done and how you wounded him. And the person still goes, no ways, I'm not listening to you. Well, then we bring the community in. And again, not this heavy-handed thing that some churches do, but the strength of community, this body of Christ going alongside the person and saying, listen, man, we're con you have wronged Craig. This is not what Jesus calls us to do. And surely the weight of the church going, this is what it means to follow Jesus. This is what God's word says. Come and follow Jesus, repent, apologize, let's have forgiveness, let's do restoration, is the way of believers. And if the person has rejected a fellow follower of Jesus, has rejected the witnesses and testimony of other people in that community, and then rejects the collective call of the community to follow Jesus and to submit to his word, Jesus goes, there's another step. That person then clearly is not a follower of Jesus. If they cannot, because remember, if we think about the, the book of Romans, our spirit testifies with his spirit that we're children of God. If this person cannot, with the words of fellow followers of Jesus that we're in community with, go, no, all right, I hear you, I've done wrong, then we recognize surely that person is not a follower of Jesus. We go, but Craig, you can't say that, but the evidence would be there of failing to hear other believers, people they trust, witnesses, and they test me, come and follow me. But even then, Jesus uses the word pagans and tax collectors, and if we followed the life of Jesus, how did Jesus treat tax collectors? Who said well? He treated them well. Because I'll think on a number, more than one occasion, Jesus invited tax collectors to meals. And he spent time with them, and he said, come and follow me. And he was accused of eating with drunkards, or being a drunken and a glutton because he ate with people who people called sinners and pagans. And so even when we treat someone like a tax collector, following Jesus doesn't mean, cheers, I'm never going to see you again. It's actually, come, I'm coming to your house for a meal, and I'm going to show you who Jesus is, and I want to introduce you to my Savior, and I'm going to invite you to come and follow him. Because that's what Jesus did to every single tax collector that he met. And so it's not this cutting off. It's not this thing. It's, and this is where we're going to get to. You're then releasing the person from the wound that they did. And you're then calling them to follow Jesus. And so whatever Jesus means by 77 times you forgive them, it is not tolerating the sin. It is not ignoring the sin. It is not forgetting or condoning or overlooking. 
But Matthew 18 gives very clear guidance. It's going and talk to them and bring it into light. It's then being safe and getting other people to go with you so you're not alone with that person again. And furthermore, it's bringing the fuller community in if needs be so that the person can see what they've done, a sin, and they come to repentance. And if they still can't, then we need to preach the gospel and show them who Jesus is and love them and invite them into the gospel and call them to follow Jesus. Just something else that forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. Reconciliation takes two people. Reconciliation is you both meeting in the middle of a street and reconciliation is the person going, you are right, I sinned against you. Will you please forgive me? Reconciliation takes the other person to go, I acknowledge my sin and I'm gonna humble myself and I'm gonna repent to you and to whoever else I need to and so will you please forgive me? How many of, people, of us just love that conversation? I mean, that's even harder than going to speak to someone about our sin. And so most of the time, we're not going to experience reconciliation. We hope to. It should be there in a godly community, but sometimes we're being sinned against by people who are not followers of Jesus. And so we can't expect reconciliation from them. But forgiveness does not mean reconciliation. And also, just to clear, clarify, forgiveness does not mean that the person escapes consequences. Because if we follow what Jesus is talking about, what is the full consequence of someone who is not going to hear what you have to say, or the witnesses, or the community? It's not we treat you like an outsider. We're going to need to remove you and boundary ourselves and treat you like someone who doesn't follow Jesus. And the way we engage with you is gonna to need to be through the gospel and not in community and intimate relationship because you are not safe. And so it doesn't even mean escaping consequences. I just wanna take a, a, a small digress here. If you are in a relationship where you are not safe because of how you're being treated, Jesus never expects you to stay there. And if you are not safe and you are in an abusive relationship, you can seek help within this community and there are people who can help you navigate getting safe and getting safe immediately. Because this nonsense that uh, just because you're a follower of Jesus, no, you have to stay where you are and keep offering forgiveness while you are repeatedly being abused for whatever reason is absolute nonsense. And Jesus never, ever taught that. And so if you are not safe, come and speak to myself uh, after the service or we're gonna have some of our prayer team that are always here. We can get you safe um, if that is what you need. And I would encourage you to do that. So then what does Jesus mean by forgiveness? So he then explained what forgiveness is by teaching a parable and he teaches the nature of the kingdom and he starts off with a ridiculous parable that if you had known some of the context when I read it the first time, you would have burst out laughing at the ridiculous nature of the story Jesus is telling. And so Jesus says there was a guy who owed his master 10,000 talents. You guys aren't laughing. It's one of, you know. So a talent is worth 20 years of your salary. Right? 20, that's one talent is 20 years. He owned 10,000 talents. If my math is correct, that's 200,000 years of wages that he owed this guy. That is ridiculous. So if you take the median income of Joburg, which is 160,000 rand a year is what the average Joburger earns, uh, that's 38.2 billion rand that he finds himself in debt. Now, that is a lot of money to be in debt in. Okay, that's a lot of debt. And he is now called to account. And if you know Every country has a debt collection mechanism. If you have loaned money, creditors, banks, interest, 
people come after their money. And in Jesus' day, in this culture, there are debt collection mechanisms. And this master is telling his accounts, and he calls this guy in and says, right, where is my 10,000 bags of gold, the 38 billion rand that you owe me? And of course, he says, I can't pay it. Now, there is a very good and clear mechanism for justice and judgment in Jesus' day, and it was called debt slavery. And so what would happen is if you did not have the means to pay back the debts, all your possessions would be sold. We do something similar in South Africa. But then your family would be sold to that person. You would go to their estate, and you would work, you and your family, till uh, you've worked off what you owe on that estate. Once the amount is paid up, your debt is gone. There was also in the Old Testament the year of Jubilee, which was every 70 years or so, everybody's debt was supposed to be canceled. But up until the time of Jesus, unfortunately, that had never been done. But this debt working off was a viable and legitimate thing that people did to make sure their debt was paid. But if he owes and needs to pay back 200,000 years of wages, that's it. The rest of his life and his family, they're done. They're in debt slavery forever. And so this guy has mercy. He forgives him. He lets him go. He releases and cancels the debt that he legitimately should be paid back. This man owes this amount of money, but the master frees him. He releases him. He doesn't give the justice that's supposed to be met out. He lets him go. And as you know, in the ridiculousness of the parable that Jesus is teaching, this guy goes out and this guy owes him a couple hundred bucks and starts to choke him in the streets. Pay back what you owe me. And I wonder if he picked this up. Because then he goes and he has the person thrown in jail. He goes through the processes of getting his debt paid back. But where there is legitimate uh, mechanisms for people to pay back debts, like debt slavery, where you go onto the estate and you work back the money, he doesn't do that. He puts him in prison. How is he supposed to work back what he owes in prison? So what this guy has done, is this about justice or is it about vengeance? Vengeance. Isn't it so interesting what Jesus is telling in this parable? He's just revealed the law mech that lives in our hearts. Where he could have shown justice and mercy, he chokes him out on the streets and says, pay back the little that you owe me and has him thrown in prison where he is unable to put him into a position where he can pay back what he owes. So I love the statements because we're looking at forgiveness. Forgiveness. And we mustn't get confused here because what this guy was doing in this parable was refusing to put the person who has wronged him in an impossible position where they can't make it right. So forgiveness is refusing to put a person in an impossible position where they can't make it right. Because what we are seeing here and this upside down nature of the kingdom is where this person is lavishly forgiven. He has this unpayable debt that's just been released. And then he goes and gets vengeance on someone. And that's our sinful nature. That's not maybe what we do externally, but lives in our hearts unchecked when we think about people who have wronged us. And this is what Jesus is actually calling us to. Because what forgiveness is, is in our hearts we release the person who has wronged us. And again, this is important and something that we might miss is Jesus is talking about the heart. And while our heart is just a muscle that pumps blood through our body, often in the ancient world, and we sometimes do it here, is we attach organs to emotions or emotions to organs. And so, for example, in Jesus' day and in, in that time period, your, your stomach, your guts was compassion. And that's where compassion lived. 
And we would say heart is where, where love, you know, all the gushy emotions live, but actually it's where will lives. And so when Jesus talks about the heart, he's talking about our will. And this is where it's a conscious decision and that follows by actions, that in my heart, you who have wronged me, I release you. And I'm not going to put you in an impossible position where you can't repent. Because this amazing thing about forgiveness is sometimes we don't want the person to apologize. Because should the person apologize, then we have to forgive them. And then we release them. When actually all we want to do is choke them on the street. And, and this is causing us to go into our hearts and go, I'm not going to put you in a position where you can't repent and where I can't apologize and where we can't do reconciliation and actually live out the kingdom like we're supposed to. And so this is the choice, the will that we make And it's fitting that we are going to do communion this morning because Jesus is teaching a parable about the kingdom and who is the father in the parable that Jesus taught? He's the king, right? He's the master who calls in his debts. And who am I in the parable? I'm the person that had the unpayable debt. Because when I look at my life as a follower of Jesus, what does every single one of us have to do when we follow Jesus? We have to come to a place of repentance before who? The King. And we have to acknowledge how we've sinned against our Heavenly Father. And then when we think about communion, what happened in our relationship between our Father? Why are we sitting in this room together as followers of Jesus? Because I had a debt that I could not pay. And not only did I have a debt I could not pay, but my heavenly Father who deserved justice for being sinned against sent his only son to die in my place, died the death that I should have died and I got justice, mercy, or he did not get justice, but I got mercy, grace, and forgiveness for all of my sin. And I know the kind of person I was before Christ. And I've known the things that I've needed to repent of since. And again, here we can do a show of hands. How many of us needed to pray for forgiveness in the last 24 hours? All right, everybody's nodding. And what about the 24 hours before that? And what about the 24 hours before that? And so when I think about my relationship with the Father, how many times have I had to come before my heavenly Father and repent again and again and again for how I've sinned against Him? And what do I want from Him every time I come in repentance? What do I want? I want forgiveness. And what do I receive from Him? I've received forgiveness. The scriptures say, new are his mercies for us every single day. Where sin abounds, grace abounds even more so. That the nature of my relationship with my heavenly father is forgiveness that makes no sense. That Jesus died where I should have died. And the extremity of the punishment that was poured out on Jesus is what I deserve, but I did not get it. I got mercy. I got forgiveness. He released me from the punishment and debt of sin, which was debt. He released me. And he does it every single day. And this is why he says, pray every day for God. Father, forgive me and allow me to forgive other people. Because this is the state of our nature is I can pray and have my sins forgiven by Jesus and walk out of that conversation and be on the road from having my sins forgiven and go choke someone on the street in vengeance. 
That's what happens when I forget what Jesus has done for me. And that is the extent of our nature, which is why we pray every single day, Jesus or Father, forgive me and let me forgive other people. And we need to remember this as we come to the communion table, as we remember this is his body broken for me because of my sin and his blood poured out in forgiveness of me. That I come to him over and over again for forgiveness. And the nature of someone who follows Jesus, who lives out the kingdom, is I live this every single day. As Jesus released me from the debt and punishment of sin, so I will it in my heart that he helps me do that to everyone else. And the more I live like that, the more I'm going to have compassion on people, the more I'm gonna have compassion on my spouse, on my children, on my neighbors, on the people that I encounter, the person who cuts me off in traffic. Because when we forget what Jesus has done for us and we choke out the person on the street, this is what we do. We boil the person down this complex person that has all this stuff going on in their lives and we boil it down to what they did to us. You are a liar. You are a cheater. Instead of thinking, sure, I have lied in my life because there has been a time in my life, different time, different circumstances, different person where my pride or my selfishness or my lies or my character caused pain in their life. Again, we're not condoning We're not forgetting, we're not tolerating, we're not sweeping under the carpet, but I have received such lavish forgiveness and release from the Father and recognizing that I have done this to other people at another time. And so let me see you as a human being, this mixed bag, and not boil you down to your sin and just your sin that you've done to me. And so then I want to just have vengeance on you for who you are. But rather, as I have been forgiven, I'm going to will it in my heart. And I'm going to try and trust the Father. But I'm then going to go to you and I'm going to speak to you about it. And if I have to, I'm going to bring two or three other people. If not, I'm going to invite the wider community in to deal with this. Because we do conflict differently in the kingdom. And then I'm going to love you even beyond that. And if you don't, even if people lovingly come and show you and point out that you have sinned, we're still going to invite you into a relationship with Jesus and love you like Jesus loved everyone. But as we come to communion, let us remember the weight of forgiveness we received in Jesus and how that forgiveness extends to us daily it is new and that is the foundation for being in the kingdom is how much I have been forgiven that there is not a single person who can do anything that could be too great for the love and the forgiveness and the release of that from Jesus because of that as my lived reality I will refuse to put a person in an impossible situation where they cannot receive my forgiveness and while I'm saying these things I know that some of you now might be sitting with a very heavy heart because of the things that were done to you I don't make light of that and I know this is I know what I'm asking you to do I'm asking you to will it in your heart that you start to release them in forgiveness they might never know forgiveness holds us captive they might never know but I'm asking you because we follow Jesus and we want to become like him live the way that he lived I'm asking you that as we think about his body broken for us, his blood poured out for us, that you would start to trust Jesus to move you to a place where you release them 
in you extend forgiveness in your hearts, a decision that you make because of what Jesus has done for you. The person might be in your life still. They might be in this very room. Let's live with grace towards each other and, and, and start to do and put into place what He is calling us to. We're not going to rush communion. We've still got a few minutes. I want us, now communion is a joy. We celebrate. But I want us to think with a bit more weights around us. I want us, when we take the body, remember how it was broken for me and his blood, how it was poured out in forgiveness for my sin. And spend time searching your heart. Go, Jesus, have I really forgiven people that have wronged me or wounded me? And if he is starting to remind you of some things, don't just rush into eating it and drinking it. Pray. And I'm gonna pray for us. Invite the Holy Spirit to help you release, to remind you of the weight of your own forgiveness and to start doing that. And again, as I invited you, if you need prayer, if you want prayer before you take communion this morning, prayer team, I know this is a little different. Come and be available. We'll make this space here, these front seats here available, that if you just want prayer to help you release some people in forgiveness before you take communion, we'll do that. And then you can take communion if you do it that way around. But let's, let's do this together and allow the Spirit to work in our hearts this morning. Father God, as we think about the fullness and weight of your word, there's no denying that you are calling us to release people. People who have never acknowledged how they've sinned. People who have refused to acknowledge how they've sinned against us. But Jesus, while we were still enemies of you, you died for us that on the cross you called out, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That in every way you modeled to us releasing people in forgiveness. Jesus, we cannot even quantify the obscene amount of forgiveness we have received in you. The amount is just too, too big to perceive. I mean, it's 200,000 years of, of wages is how you try to get us to think about it in this parable. That you, that you released that debt of that sin. And you were able to release it because it was you, Jesus, who died on our place on the cross for our sins.